Okay, Dom. You know what I'd like to do when I'm hanging out with Dom from Staven Sports Cards? I like, like to win some baseball cards. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> hey, so uh, we'll give a few people a few minutes to join. Hopefully, hopefully, I, I talked Pepino Man in joining as well. And so I was watching, uh, you know, I, I, the King of uh, Collectibles last night. I watched uh, a few episodes and it, I, I got to relive the whole hype around the logo man and i just i don't know maybe i'm maybe i'm old maybe i'm out of touch with the hobby so i wanted to have a young collector on get another person's perspective on what is the deal with the logo man and uh, i'll preface it by saying that you know the the images on the cards are next to nothing right and the card really is the NBA logo. And I, I understand they're short printed, but it's like they're, I know they're technically a card, but they're not like the traditional cards because it's, it's mostly the NBA logo. So my question is really the first thing that I think of is if I wanted the NBA logo on there, if that's it, or if I wanted the NBA logo rather, and that's what I was going for. Why wouldn't I just buy a jersey? I mean, what do they wear? A hundred different jerseys over the course of a year? And you could pay a tiny fraction than you could for this manufactured scarcity of a card. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I do know that the players have been really monetizing the game used factor of it. That's why tops and these companies aren't putting like the real good certification that it was used in an official MLB, NFL, NBA game. But I do think that if you look at it, LeBron James had a NBA finals Jersey from the heat sell earlier this year. It was game seven of the finals, the clinching game. And that sold for 3.6 million compared okay. to the 2.4 that this triple logo man sold for, which those could have been from any type of summer league or NBA game. Yeah, so, that's my that's my understanding. Nowadays, they don't say it's from anything. I mean, he could have just put it on and taken it right off, right? Yeah, I do think that with a car that's that big, they did get gamers for it. But again, it's so hard for them to pay up for the actual like game used gritty stuff to like chop it up into cards now that they don't end up doing it as often. Like you said, they'll just have players wear them at different events and stuff. Now, do you know anything about those logo man cards as far as, I mean, I'm assuming they're like all the others where they don't tell you what it's from. They just say it's player worn, not from any specific event or anything like that. Do you know if that's the case with those? Because I mean, I mean if it was from some <laughs> big game or something like that, uh, you know, that changes the story a bit. Yeah, I'd have, I'd have to look at the back of one of the cards because all I ever see is is the gaudy, ugly front of them. Because um, that's the thing about that card, too, is I don't think they look very good to begin with. I think Topps has their Dynasty product for baseball, where it's like an actual nice picture of the player, and then they fit the logo in there. But the triple logo, man, it's such an emphasis on the NBA logo that it kind of takes away, like you said, the pictures are so small and it doesn't feel quite like a normal card, even from a high end product. Yeah. So is it the scarcity? Is that what, and I should point out manufactured scarcity. Is that what point, but, and, but do other, do other, um, I don't know, LeBron one-on-one sell for that kind of money. Do you know? Yeah. I mean, LeBron stuff does sell for sure. And this was a big chase card in that product. I know that Ken Golden had like Drake and they were looking for that product and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, I saw that. There's a lot of high profile people that were interested in that card because there was that triple logo <laughs> man with Jordan, Kobe and LeBron that sold for a lot as well. So it, it, it's a big chase card for Panini's basketball product. But at the, at the same time, it was the most expensive card to be sold that was pulled in the same year. Yeah, I mean, there's no doubt that LeBron cards sell for uh, most money, most of the, the big auctions, you know, the LeBrons are in there, uh, several of them usually. If you look at the top 10 auctions, it's almost always a few LeBrons on there. And they sell for more than a lot of the 52 Mantles and Babe Ruths and Ty Cobbs and all those guys. Uh, 
you know, in recent years, Tom Brady's been on there a lot too. I don't know if it, you know, you're a New England fan, right? I don't know if that will change after his retirement. Uh, regardless, he'll he'll always be the goat, no matter when it is. But you know, there's that phenomenon when people are leading up, like usually after they they're done playing, there's a lull, and then when they get elected to the Hall of Fame, there's another spike uh, for a while, and then there's a, a lull, and they they kind of average in where they're going to stay. It's not like there's any new news coming in uh, coming out on Babe Ruth or Mickey Mantle or Ty Cobb or Roberto Clemente, right? And they just tend to go up uh, gradually over time from there. Uh, but this logo, man, just as somebody, you know, an old time collector, what the young people are calling OG collector, right? Uh, it's just beyond belief to me that these cards are, uh, that they go for this much amount of money. I don't know what uh, anybody that's watching here, uh, welcome your comments, your feedback, because I just don't get it. Uh, while we take a little lull there and and wait for some comments, Dom. I wanted to, uh, you know, give you a, an opportunity. You started a new venture with a podcast, right? Yeah, I did, John. Uh, the Solo Shot Sports Podcast. I have a YouTube channel for that that I can uh, definitely drop in the comments after this video is published. Uh, but it's a baseball podcast where I take you around the bases about topics that I think baseball fans want to hear about. And then to keep the stories of the past alive, because I love the history of baseball I throw it back at third base to that day in baseball history and try to just bring it back to a cool moment to highlight a player or something from the game because baseball history is American history and it's a really cool thing. Yeah, you know, I just did a video on this Hans Lobert. Uh, this is the only one PSA has ever graded. Uh, it's a very rare set, Collins McCarthy from 1917. And he was the first player ever to bat against Babe Ruth. And, uh, and people are like, uh, wow, how do you find those rare gems or whatever? But it's like in the modern day with the investors and the flippers and even a lot of the newer collectors and even even some older collectors, you know, a lot of times it's the cards that are more important than the games themselves. And to me, honestly, I'm to the point where the cards are more important than the games themselves to me. Uh, but it, it's like... Um, you know, people don't know the history of the sports or even care. Uh, I was watching a breaker not so long ago, a reseller, flipper, whatever you want to call it. And he was doing a video and he was calling Sandy Koufax, Sandy Kofa. And I won't, e I, since you're from Boston uh, area, I, I wouldn't even, I don't even want to insult you by telling you how he was pronouncing Yaz's name. Uh, but it was clear that he had no clue who Carl Yaskrimski and, and, and Sandy Koufax were. Uh, but you know, he's getting the cards, sending them in for grading and, and selling them. And I think that is the point that we've gotten to. And so, you know, there's a lot I don't understand in the hobby anymore. A lot of things have passed me by and I've really stopped participating in, in a lot of it. Uh, like a lot of it is just noise to me. It's like when you get so sick and tired of what's going on in the world, you turn the news off. Well, I'm to that you know, I'm getting to that point in the hobby where I'm just going to turn it all off and go back to collecting in obscurity when I was happy as a lark by myself doing my own thing and didn't have the influences of, uh, the, you know, what's important to other people and, and the craziness of what's going on. So anyway, uh, so what are the topics of the, uh, what, what are the, some of the topics you've done recently on your podcast? Yeah, so this past weekend, I talked about uh, Steve Carlton being the first left-handed pitcher to throw for 3,000 strikeouts and bringing back that moment with Tim Wallach from the Expos and striking him out and having that moment. Because Steve Carlton, I, I think pitchers in the general in the hobby are very underrated, but in the grand scheme yes. of baseball, because they don't hit, and it's not just chicks that dig the long ball, it's everybody. They <laughs> want the offense, they want the excitement these pitchers kind of get overlooked completely. And Steve Carlton, he set all these left-handed records. And then Randy Johnson comes in the next decade and is exciting with the strikeout. He's so much bigger than life. He kills a bird with a pitch. Like he has this aura to him where Steve Carlton kind of gets forgotten about in a lot of baseball discussions. So just kind of trying to teach some people about Steve Carlton and why it was so amazing when he finally got 3000 Ks. 
Well, I'll tell you, I think he's underappreciated. When I was growing up, he was my favorite pitcher. I thought he was the best pitcher of the 70s. I remember when I was a little kid, we had a, a, a family friend who was a, a chiropractor, and he was a big sports fan, big baseball fan. And I remember I, I was a little kid, and I, I would get into a debate. I would get into debates with him, which most people probably find um, hard to believe that I would get into debates. But um, I was a shy little kid, so I didn't. Uh, I didn't really talk much to anybody. But this su subject would pump me up, and I used to get in debates with him over who who was the best pitcher. And I would always say Steve Carlton, and he thought Nolan Ryan was. <clears throat> but Steve Carlton was an amazing pitcher and a quirky guy. You know, he was into Zen and uh, in the locker room would kind of just do his own thing and meditate. And, uh, you know, other players kind of thought he was a bit strange. Uh, but that just added to his allure. He was an aloof guy. And I don't know if you've ever listened to the R2C2 podcast with CC Sabathia and Ryan Rucco, but he really gets into like the mindset of a of a pitcher and him and John Lester were talking and how they were just like, pitchers are weird, man. Like we have these routines and we're wired differently. Like it's a whole different thing, especially a starting pitcher when you're preparing to go every fourth day, fifth day and yeah. throw at the crazy velocity and movement that they're doing nowadays. Like there's just so many things that go into the mindset of a pitcher. And Steve Carlton definitely was very aloof. Yeah, that that's fascinating. That reminds me of singers or artists. Um, it's like, you know, if you go back throughout time, uh, poets, artists, uh, singers, performers, if they weren't weird, their stuff wasn't any good. You know, you look at Prince, Michael Jackson, uh, Jackson Pollock. Uh, there was a, there was a um, uh, what was her name? Dorothy Parker. She was a famous poet. She was the first female, first female editor of the New Yorker, and I think it was the New Yorker. Uh, but she was a famous poet and she must have written seven poems about committing suicide, stuff like that. Uh, you know, they're just um, um, <laughs> artists. There's something that they have to be kind of quirky to be great, you know. And so it's it's interesting you say that about pitchers. Now, Steve Carlton was involved in one of the most lopsided trades ever. Right. Wasn't it Rick Wise that was traded for him? Do I have that right? You know, I, I, that does sound right, but it was kind of a thing where he couldn't come to an agreement with the Cardinals on his salary. Right. And they just decided to move him and they sent him to the worst team in the National League at the time in Philadelphia as kind of like a punishment for trying to want too much money. They, they yeah, sent I think, him to Philly and he broke out there. I think they were probably the ones punished, but uh, I mean, neither neither one of those teams really lit it up or, uh, you know, won four World Series. So maybe maybe it didn't matter much and they got to keep their money. But I'll tell you this, as a fan, I would have been missing out if I didn't get the opportunity to watch Steve Carlton pitch. I, I'm, I'm, I'm a better as a sports fan to have seen it, you know? No, definitely. And I know you wanted me to keep on the chat for questions. A quick one from Mike at Sexton's Kentucky Cardboard. He said, how do the rookies have Logoman cards when they haven't even played yet? Or are they delayed? A lot of times for the rookies, they have like photo shoot showcase days for all the rookies where they wear multiple uniforms and that's what they chop them up for. And that's what really shocks me because one of the big chase cards for a lot of younger collectors is an RPA, a rookie patch auto, which usually is from those photo shoot jerseys because they haven't played in games yet which adds to the element of oh, we don't have to pay for game used we can manufacture a way to get this on the player's body and then sell it for a premium like in the aftermarket and make it a chase yeah i heard somebody that was with the players i think it was pepino on a live we were discussing this and he said that they would give them a shirt they'd put it on take it off give it over here to be cut up get another one, put it on, take it off, get it over here. So the rookie jersey, and I just got a few, and I and I pointed out, like, I realize this is crap, right? It's it's crap, but it's still a cool card. But to pay up for that seems rather ridiculous, seems silly to me. But lots of things seem silly to me these days, Dom. I just don't get a lot of what, what goes on. I mean, when I see, you know, these these kinds of things, you know, I say it all the time, you know the collection I have. And you could pull a, a card out of a pack today that would be worth more than my entire collection. 
it's just a totally different world. And it is, you know, it's insane to me. Yes, it is, but it's the way it is. And speaking of the insanity, another one that I kind of just wanted to get your reaction on was uh, Carlisle from The Battery. He said, how long before they make a modern mantle card with pieces from a 1952 Topps mantle? <laughs> like chopping up a butchered 52 mantle and making that the relic on the card. That's a good one. And you know what? That thing would probably sell like crazy. It would go uh, for auction at a big amount. People uh, were buying with fractional piece. ownership of cards at one point during the boom. Yep. They tried making that a thing. So I don't think that's a new thing. I think back in the uh, was I think back in the early nineties or early two thousands they were doing that. So I, I, I remember that happening. I don't I don't know that any specifics, but I think that wasn't a new concept. It was new to me at least. I had not heard of it until it was getting publicized during the boom. Yeah, and I can understand that. Like if you're investing in a Picasso just for the investment. You could care less about art. It doesn't mean anything to you. I get it. You know, it's, I, I totally get that. I'm not going to put anybody down for doing it for, uh, because I, I understand it. Uh, but there are two, there are two or there are two factions now in the industry. You know, it's the ones that just see dollar signs when they look at cards and collectibles. And then there are people who collect. And I think during the boom, what you saw was a bunch of flippers selling to each other. Because I don't, I don't think it's a true collectors that are paying, you know, two hundred forty-two thousand dollars for a Clay Thompson, like or forty-two thousand, I should say, is what, or even a uh, the uh, Cunha went for, was it a Cunha or Tatis went for like two forty-two, two hundred forty-two thousand dollars. Like I don't, I don't think those are collectors that are doing that, right? I don't know. I could be wrong. I mean, you have, uh, there are collectors who are billionaires uh, over in China or Japan, uh, all over the all over the world, and, and certainly in this country, and people like Drake, and some of these ballplayers themselves are collectors. So there's a lot of money to be spent. And if you were a card collector, I could see you paying up for a lot of cards. But when you see a card that doesn't have a history of selling for hundreds of thousands of dollars. And then all of a sudden, boom, it sells for 242,000 out of nowhere. I, I don't know. That's uh, that, that to me seems to be what uh, Vegas Dave was doing where he was hyping it to his, having his friends bid on it, bid them way up so that next time they sell the card, it'll go for higher amounts of money. Hey, I think that's Papino. Hey, hey, there what's he up guys? What's up, S.A.? Nothing. Yeah, I, like I told you, man, I, I just had to make my obligatory uh, May the Force Be With You video showing off a couple of my Star Wars things. Uh, that's mandatory on the uh, May 4th. Well, I'm glad uh, glad we could uh, you could join us. So uh, the idea, and uh, I, w I was interested in your insight as a longtime collector, coming back to the day, um, on this logo man phenomenon and things like it really uh why they go for so much money you have any insight into this uh well one of the things that i've been saying since 2020 when all the influencers and the pumpers kind of started pumping the modern stuff and so you know you would have rookies going for hall of famer prices and stuff like that so you would have the logo men also going for like astronomical prices. One of the things that I used to tell people that I believe was like people, not the pumpers are selling this stuff for the price. It should probably, it might be at 20 years from now. You know what I mean? Like say when the 52 Mickey Mantle came out, it's like somebody back then trying to sell it for a thousand dollars when it wasn't even worth that in the eighties. That's kind of how I see uh, the logo man and a lot of the modern stuff going for right now is like these people are predicting like the prices they might be 20 years from now, especially like the rookies and stuff. You know what I mean? Yeah. But what's the fascination with them to begin with? I mean, aren't you the one that told me, aren't you the one that told me you were at a photo shoot where they would just put the shirt on, take it off? Oh, yeah. It on, take it off. No, it was not necessarily a photo shoot, but say like on um, 4th of July, Independence Day, stuff like that. I would see the players coming out of the locker room and there'd be guys with, the, you know, jerseys for everybody on the team. 
the guys will come out, put it on real quick, and, and take it off and hand it right back to the guy and then put their game jersey on and go play the game. Now, I mean, to me, that is a completely disingenuous when they put that in a card. Like, that's almost a scam. What are your What are your thoughts on it, Don? Well, oh, Pepino, uh, go ahead. I was going to say go ahead, they're, they're just playing in the lines there because if they say player worn – and the player technically did wear it, that'll hold up in a courtroom. So they don't oh, I get to, they that. Don't have to worry I, about that. Yeah. I mean, there's a line between legality yeah. and ethics, right? Things yeah, can that's... certain certain things can be legal but unethical. Yeah, I mean the, the it's it's almost like buyer beware. You really have to do your um you know your research on this. I remember seeing a, a video a long time ago, uh uh, with Nate and um, you know, and they were talking about what all the different stuff means behind the card. You know, game worn, game used, player worn, event used. They broke it down. They told you the truth about everything. So you know, if you're informed, you know what it means. But if you're not, you just think, oh, he wore this in a game, you know, and you fall for it. Yeah. So uh, let's so logo man or a fifty two Mickey Mantle in a two, which one uh, selling for the same price? Which one do you go for, Dom? I'll buy a bunch of great stuff for the same price as either of those. <laughs> I don't. No, want you have you cars. have the choice. You have the choice to buy one, same price. If I have to choose. I'm taking. The you mantle. have the money. Yeah. Which one? I'm taking the mantle. You're taking the mantle, Papino. I I shouldn't even ask you. That's not fair because you're a mantle fan. Well, one of the things too, when the the very first time that I seen the Logo Man card, I mean, I don't know if you guys are talking specifically about the LeBron James one. I remember I was like the first big one, the the triple Logo Man, and it was and people were before it even sold, people were oh this is gonna go, this is gonna break the Mickey Mantle. People were pumpers and influencers influencers were rooting for it to take down the mantle. And they were giving these astro astronomical prices that it would go for, and it didn't. But I remember the first time that I seen that card, like before it actually got pulled, and people were saying, like, this is going to be out. I said, that's an ugly card. I go, where's LeBron James? Like, you know, it's like, that's not a, a card. That's, you know, it, it, where's the player on it? It just, I, I didn't Yeah, like that, that's the thing. thing. There's no player image. Like, yeah, before you joined, that was my that's what I was saying. There's really no player image on it. So what you're doing is you're buying that logo man logo. You're buying that that patch, right? Yeah. And so my my immediate question is at that point, I know technically it's a card, but to me it's more of a memorabilia piece. Yeah. Exactly. And so if I'm gonna if I'm buying it just for that emblem, just for that NBA patch, why wouldn't I just buy a full jersey that's yeah, right. way nicer? <laughs> To me, the full jersey would be more valuable than it cut into pieces and, and thrown on a piece of cardboard. Yeah, now we were talking about the fact that that logo pat that's in that card could be from anything. It's not from anything special. So these guys wear 50, 100 jerseys a season. I don't know how many they wear, but... Yeah, the, uh, oh, yeah. I, you know. So you, wouldn't it be cheaper? I mean, I mean, it's so much cheaper just to buy a game-worn jersey. That logo patch, we don't even know, um, we don't even know what it's from. Did, did he yeah. just put it on and take it off? I, I think Is it that, from an actual game? I think what, I, they I don't know. Claimed, what they claim was it was from a different uh, team. Uh, the three yeah. different teams that he played on. One was from the yeah. Cavs. One was from the Lakers. You know, one was from the Heat. You know, that that's what the claim was on, on those logo. Yeah. Is it game worn? Does it say game worn? I don't know if it you is. Know? I'm assuming it is if you want to pay millions of dollars for it. <laughs> yeah, but they don't say that on the back anymore. Well, yeah, I guess they do, but they're very generic. So I guess it would. It says from an actual event usually, doesn't it? Well, even um, which could have been a video, dinner. There, there was a video where there was a video where they interviewed um Emmett Smith, and he talked about that where he said you could get a card that says game worn, but game worn only means that he put it on and took it off on a game day. He's like, it's yeah, I mean, game used to say it was actually used during the game. Right. This is this is the thing, and it might not even have been his game. Like he could yeah. he could put it on in an Arizona yeah, Cardinals he, he uh, Steelers game. game. He could have been sideline <laughs> during an injury, but it says right. game or, worn. Or he could have been wearing it when he was watching the Super Bowl or something. 
Yeah, exactly. Uh, they're so non-specific with these things. We don't know what they're from. So that begs the question: Why are you paying, you know, two point four million for these things? I, I don't get it. Like I was saying earlier, I don't have to get it. It doesn't matter. Uh, but it just fascinates me. Uh, what sells these days for ridiculous amounts of money? Oh, big time! I mean, that's that's the whole thing with all these these rookies and prospects come out as like their prices are higher than actual Hall of Famers. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, why? You know, he had. Well, it seems like back in the day, we we evaluated players like almost year by year performance. Now it goes by game. A guy could suck for a month. And then yeah. he, one game he has two home runs and his price is going to skyrocket. Is That's that true. You're sitting on the couch watching a game and you're on eBay. Oh, this yeah. guy looks good. Let me grab some cards. Yeah. No, you're yeah. you're right about that. Now, now the the uh, prospect phenomenon has always existed and it's always blown my mind. Right? Like you have these guys that come up. Many of them were scrubs. They ended up being scrubs. But when they come up, you look at Johnny Football, Johnny Manziel, Manziel. For, as an example, um, I remember when I first got back into collecting again, um, he was the big rookie. And I'm like, why are his cards selling for this? This guy hasn't thrown an NFL pass yet, right? And then, of course, in his first preseason game or his first game, man, he got annihilated. He looked like the worst quarterback that ever played in the existence of football. And uh, I was like, see, this is why you don't pay up for these. And, and you can't give a Johnny football card away now. Well, and I they mean, were selling for ridiculous amounts of money. And that was before the boom. Well, I mean, you think about Anthony Volpe on the Yankees. He had, like, the first couple of games. Yeah. He was hot. His prices skyrocketed. Like, oh, this is – he's going to be better than Mickey Mantle. And, like, right. where is he now? What is he Well, here's the now? thing. Some of these guys are priced like the next Tom Brady or the yeah, next exactly. Mike Trout or the next Babe Ruth. And here's the thing. There isn't going to be a next Tom Brady. There isn't going to be a next Babe Ruth. And so for you to be paying more for these uh, prospects cards than for the goats uh, is, is insane because they're never going to live up to that. You yeah, know, well, even if, and if, if they only live up, if they win five Super Bowls instead of 10 or 11, they're going to what? They're, you know, their cards are going to be worth money, sure, but not what you're paying today. Yeah, I mean, that, that was a big example of people were saying, um, I think last year, you know, when, when the Rams won the Super Bowl, it's like, we got an actual Super Bowl winner, but his cards aren't going for anything. People are still paying more for the prospects that they think are going to win a Super Bowl. You know, when Stafford won a Super Bowl, his cards didn't hardly go up. Yeah, so when Jalen Hurts was making that, he had a fabulous season, right, and, and making the run to the Super Bowl, I was shocked that his cards weren't going up. They were still cheap. And even when he was in, you know, they won and they were going to the Super Bowl, they were still cheap. And uh, so I had made a comment on some video because, you know, we talk about some of these things not making sense because you have Herbert going through, the, you know, going through the roof and some other quarterbacks that, uh, are not, uh, may never see a, a Super Bowl. And they're like, well, it's because he lost. And, and that wasn't my point. My point was I was surprised they weren't going up before he lost. You know what yeah. I mean? But even still... He went to his Super Bowl and lost, but uh, so did Burrow. And Burrow cards were, were still still high. Well, uh, you and, know what? And so you, it's it's just interesting to me that some rookies fly and others don't. It's like, yeah. do people not believe they're going to sustain that? Because well, other, other players, they have 12 championships written in. Yeah. See, that's, that's what's weird is like, you know, I've been collecting for like 40 years. You know what I mean? And I've never in my life experience where – Players are super hot. They're breaking records, but the card prices are going down because that's what's happening right now. It's like all these players are super hot and doing breaking records, but their prices are going down because they were overpriced in 2020. Yeah. You know? And back to my other point, Mahomes' cards continue to go up after he lost the Super Bowl. <laughs> but, yeah, here's the thing. Like, if, you, uh, if your card should be worth this, and there's a big boom, and now it's worth this, any investment, any investment. Take tech stocks if you want to use a, a different example. If it's supposed to be worth this and it goes way up here and comes back halfway back to where it started to begin with, it's still a heck of an investment if you bought at the right time. If you bought at the right time. Exactly. And, and just whether it's real estate or right before the collapse or tech stocks right before 2022 
or whatever. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Like if I bought Tesla in um, in 2019, and I went through the big boom of uh, 2021, and then it pulled back in 2022. Well, I still might be up substantially on it because I yeah. bought it at a good price. I didn't, yeah. you know, I didn't pay a ridiculous amount of money for it. And I think that's what we're seeing now is cards. They're still more than they were, right? Before the yeah. boom. Oh, yeah. They they're just coming down to earth a little bit, which I think, it, I think is healthy. I think that's basically, healthy. Basically, if you bought in 2020, you got burned almost. <laughs> yeah, you bought at the top, just like if you bought internet stocks before the, the early 2000 collapse, right? If you bought them at the top. Now, many of those came way back long term. So, uh, even if you want to make fun of some of these people, um, sports card investor for paying, you know, overpaying for every card he bought, well, uh, you know, I'll, 10 years from now, five years from now, maybe even two or three years from now, I'll give you an he, example. he may make out on him. We, you don't I know. Only time will tell. What you're talking about. Uh, pre, pre 2020, uh, I bought this like Kobe auto. All right. It's a Kobe autograph. I got it for 80 bucks. All right. This is pre 2020. During 2020, it went up to this specific card right here went up to like three thousand dollars yeah all right but right now it's at a thousand you know what right. i mean so i bought it for 80. i'm still winning on this card but if you're right. one of the people that bought this in 2020 for you know after his right after his death for three thousand you're losing right now right you know it's just and like that, that's anything in life 2021 were the investors you know what I that's mean? anything in life it's like when it's timing of when you make the buy and it's yeah. not even you know timing the sell isn't as important as timing the buy because you could sell like you said you could sell right now and make a huge profit more you know um but uh <clears throat> well see i don't I, know I, I don't know some of those I, I don't i don't you know you know what um i i follow I've been watching a lot of TikTok uh, card videos. And what was trending in 2020 and 2021 were like, this card was worth this much eight months ago, and now it's worth this much, and, you know, skyrocketing. Right now yeah. what's trending is this card sold in 2020 for this much, and right now it was sold last month for a loss of $5,000. Like all these cards, like that's what's trending now is how much people lost. You know well, I mean? I'll tell you, my, my take on it is we're not in a collapse. We're oh. in a correction uh, because I'm still amazed. I'm still amazed at what some of these cards sell for. They're yeah. still, it, to me, still way overpriced. Oh, yeah. I don't know. How do well, you like, feel about it? Like, yeah, exactly <clears> how I gave you my example is like that card a few years ago was 80 bucks. How did it jump to 3000 you know, when he's, He's been passed away. What did he? He hasn't done anything. You know what I mean? Right. A lot of people haven't done anything for their prices to go. It's just, it's just the influencers and the pumpers, you know, making people feel like this is a great buy. You know, it's like, man, but these are the prices that that should appreciate like twenty years from now, not right now. What are your thoughts, Tom? I definitely think that a lot of it is, like they said, the pumpers and the marketing aspect of, of pro pushing these players up. But I think part of the pricing discrepancy and the prospecting, it's kind of the family guy thing where he has the choice between a boat and a mystery box. And he says yes. the mystery box could be anything, <laughs> even a boat. And he takes the mystery box instead of the boat and he gets disappointed with some coupon. And yeah. I JP uh, Wisco Tony he said it in the chat that people never learn they make the same mistakes like with the hobby with the prospecting and everything because you yep. can get Hall of Fame cards like this Tony Perez that I got at the Shriner show. Ooh, nice! And th this is something that's probably not going to boom up in price, but it's not going to crash the same yeah. way that if you invest in an Anthony Volpe when he's having a <laughs> hot month does and. That's part of the thing. It's more exciting for the what if, what could it be sometimes for people that are just throwing money around than what already is. Yeah, you yeah. know, so so DraftKings stock had just absolutely tanked, right? Uh, and last year, the stock market was really bad. And there's a lot of people, there's a lot of these companies that are now doing this online gambling and this and that. And they're calling for this recession, which they've been calling for. Uh, I feel like half my lifetime, it's the longest called for recession in the history of the world. 
Uh, it's been like three years now they're calling for it and, and it very well could happen. But, uh, you know, I started to think, I'm like, you know, no matter how poor people are, they're always going to gamble. That's that's like yeah. one the one vice they're not going to give up. So I loaded up on that sucker, you know, went down to I think a, around 11 bucks. They just reported really, you know, better than expected earnings today. And it's way back up. Um, but anyway, um, my point is that, yes, the gambling part of prospecting, of pack ripping, that is just never going to go away because it's in human nature. It's in yep. humans' DNA to gamble. That's what they do. And that's the gambling aspect of the hobby. Yeah. like um, Thoughts? I, yo, no, I, I totally agree. One of the things is um, when I was – uh, living in my old house, I used to stop at the Circle K for coffee, you know, because I was like right by my house. Now I stop at Sorrow because it's right on the next block from my house. But back then I would stop at the Circle K for coffee before I go to work every morning. And almost every morning there was homeless people that, you know, that I that I recognized from begging, you know, on my in my neighborhood buying lottery tickets. You know, if they get five bucks, they go buy five lottery tickets, you know. Right all the time they're 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 you know they're trying to they're gambling on that dream everybody does you know yeah yeah i mean there are rich people that are even addicted to buying lottery tickets they don't even freaking need the money <laughs> right yeah. yeah but see that that that's the thing man when um you have so many millionaires that came into the hobby and they just waste so much money but their videos make it seem like they're just winning, winning. I'm winning. And yeah. Yeah. I anybody, that, if they bought anything in 2021, um, they didn't win in 2022 and 23. No. That's just, I think, a fact. I mean, maybe here or there, but trying to make a living doing that last over the last year and a half, I, I, I man, I find it hard to believe to, to believe that anybody could do that. Unless you just followed the, the tried and true rules of, you know, breaking boxes, you could get some nice pools, you could make, you buy enough boxes, you, you do the arbitrage thing, right, where you're finding undervalued, like, you know, a 50, uh, 54 Johnson cookies, this is, this is an example I know somebody did, like where you could buy it, pick it up for 200 bucks, have it graded and sell it for two grand. You know, I, I watched that happen. So, you know, you could still make money the old fashioned way, just nice and steady um, selling, but those big, like, you know, trying to make your 10, 20, $20,000 nut at a time. Uh, that, that's not that easy unless you got lucky at the pack pool or something. Yeah. You know, but it happens. Say, say pre pandemic, the Bowman cards, they were like stuff mm -hmm. collectors were buying because it's people that were unproven. But then once you got a couple of guys that did great, you know, on their Bowman cards, like the Cunhas and the Sotos. They had great years, and the pumper just pumped them up, and all of a sudden, everybody wanted to buy Bowman, you know, draft cards, free rookies. They're not even the real rookie cards. You know what I mean? Yeah. And Dom, yep. I got to ask you this right now. What do you think about the card, your Stremski rookie? Because is it his rookie card, or is it really a prospect card? Because he didn't even play that year. It's yeah. a prospect card. Yeah, John yeah. has said it's a prospect card. But to <laughs> I've me, I've always be, considered be, a rookie be, card. You know, that's yeah. how I grew up. You know yeah, what the, I mean? The, yeah, the way I look at it is Bowman is a separate – because the Bowman cards you're talking about, that's a whole separate product than the yeah. Topps flagship. So to me, the Carl Yastrzemski is in the Topps flagship for 1960, which makes it a rookie card. Right. But the, the terminology is bad because how in the heck could you have a rookie card it's when a, you weren't a rookie yet? Well, same thing, you know what – Lou uh, Pinella had he, three rookie cards. Yeah, yeah, but what I'm saying is they should be called like first year card, second well, year card. Up in the 80s. And the rookie card should only be a rookie card during your rookie season. Yeah. Well, growing up in the 80s, what's what was always considered Mark McGuire's rookie card? 85 USA. Right? He was he wasn't even in the majors and not even, you know, so right. but that was his rookie card. But you know, but see, Bowman now, does it right now. Bowman does so that. Right they'll, now, they'll make now it it's the not first... considered a rookie card anymore because right. now people are trying to make rules and changes, and you know, it's they're trying to be strict about it and labeling. You know, but my yeah, days, and... that's his rookie card. I will always consider his Olympic card his rookie card. Yeah, I get it, and people will still call it that. But it, I don't know how the heck you could have a, a rookie card if it's not your. 
Yeah. You know, your rookie yeah. season. I, I don't know. It's saying. like it's, it's back then. What are we gonna we're gonna call three a card from two thousand and twenty Babe Ruth's last season then, card? But back then when it was a <laughs> hobby, when it was just for fun, that's what it was. Now that it's for money, people are trying to like, no, no, you know, this, this, and you know, they're <clears throat> They're trying to make rules to benefit their sales. Well, let's talk about this. You bring up a very good subject that I love to talk about and, and think about. And that is, why is a rookie card so damn important and, and go for so much more money? And let me, let, me, let me continue a minute. Like, I get it with the old vintage cards, maybe, maybe. But the new cards, it's like, you know, if, if they have 4,000 rookie cards. And yeah. the following years, they, maybe they have a card that's numbered to 10, numbered to 5. And those cards should be worth more, in my opinion, than, than a damn rookie card where there's five, you know, 5,000 different ones and you know, 100,000 of each or 20,000, whatever. Why, why is so much emphasis put on a damn rookie card? And, and if we took the emphasis off of that, that rookie card, that would do away with a lot of the, the, the prospecting, wouldn't it? I think it goes back to what I was saying about the potential, about what could be like seeing the young player and the potential to finish their career as an all time great and follow their entire career. I think that's like the excitement of it. Like, Oh, you bet right on this guy because you got in early on it versus like someone that jumped on the train way after the line. Like if you started saying Tom Brady's great after the fourth or fifth Super Bowl, you're behind the eight ball, but it's, like a whole thing like that, I think people just get excited about the like the new hot thing, and that's usually the brand new player to the team. So it, it's just always blown up, my yeah. mind, though, Dom. Like you look at the the Nolan Ryan rookie card versus his second year card. I mean, if there was no such thing as a rookie card, what collector in their right mind wouldn't rather have a second year card? Same with yeah. P. Rose. Same with yeah. Thurman right. Munson. Right. I mean, if, if, if it wasn't this manufactured hype, see, when people say I do my own thing, I don't let the hobby dictate to me, I don't believe them. Because otherwise you wouldn't pay that for a Nolan Ryan rookie card or rather have the Nolan Ryan rookie card. If it didn't, if it wasn't about the rookie card, about the money. Who's that other guy, Tomlinson? Or was that, was that other guy, everybody all, you know? Same thing with like Mike Smith, you got Ron Say. You know, I always call it the yeah. Ron Say rookie card. You know what right. I mean? Right. The Mike Hilton rookie, yeah. Yeah, well, how about the 78, you know, Paul Molitor and Alan Tremel? I mean, those cards compared to well, their first card, well, see, their that's first the full card. Too, is even back then, the, the manufacturer. Dale Murphy. Yeah, Dale Murphy. <coughs> he, has a, he has a couple hey, of rookie Andre cards. Andre Dawson. As as the card says. Yeah, Andre Dawson's second year with the trophy oh, is that's so a, much. I mean, it's a, one, one of the greatest cards ever made. And uh, you, but the, you'll pay more for the seventy-seven four, uh, with some players you never heard of. Yeah, uh, and, you you know, know, I mean, the list goes on and on and on. Yeah, just on just on that uh, the rookie card, the cup thing, like Mike Trout had a two thousand eleven, but he didn't have a two thousand twelve, right? It wasn't until he had a, he didn't have another yeah. card till like two thousand thirteen for tops. He had a two thousand. Well, these guys, I mean, they're they're he, starting uh... to get them. With, in in little league, they're starting to they're starting to get them in little league and sign some prospect cards, make some prospect cards out of them. <laughs> yeah, the the trout thing was a service time thing. So when he he was in the eleven update set, but he didn't um, have enough games or whatever to yeah, be yeah, a rookie. Absolutely. So in two thousand twelve, he didn't have the cup, but when he won like the rookie of the year and finished an MVP voting, it, that's why the thirteen card has the cup instead of the twelve. Yeah, see, time that's manipulation. Well, same thing, Mark McGuire. He has he has an eighty five, and then he has a rookie cup in eighty seven. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know about you guys, but I love the rookie cups. I always like the rookie cups better than the rookies like usually. I mean, look at Tom Seaver. Like, you know, yeah, look the, at the Tom Seaver rookie card like versus versus. Card. Yeah, Tom Seaver rookie card yeah, versus seventy eight uh, cup. Rod Carew rookie card versus rookie cup. I well, mean, he has two. Of them. Day. He has two. Doesn't he have two cup cards? Uh, Carew. Yeah, I think he has two cup oh, does cards. He? Oh, that's, he may. It's, I, the, I never it's the same about image it. on the sixty-nine, but there's no cup yeah, on the same sixty-nine. Image, right? Yeah, yeah I didn't the, think it was a cup. Same on both of them. No, yeah. I don't think there's any player in the history of of tops that had back-to-back -back cup cards. Yeah, they only I made the I cup mean, card once. Mm-hmm. 
Unless I miss something. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's the same the image. It's just zoomed in be. a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and Topps reused images. Heck, they 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 use them three years later. I just showed on the Candelaria, uh, where they reused the rookie card um, two years later. And yeah. the funny thing is, what? is on the rookie card season seventy six, which again this should be a second year card. It's not. It shouldn't be called a rookie card because he started in seventy five. But uh, the interesting thing is, is they used two different images in seventy six and then went back to the image two years later. Uh, so you know, there's all kind of nuances like this that I find fascinating when I'm going through yeah, that. I, I, I discover that I never knew before. There's a bunch of different years, like sixty eight and sixty nine, where there was a lot of repeat photos yeah there's a lot of that where they just i don't uh i mm -hmm. think there was some kind of contractual dispute you know that that's why that happened well but and there's the this other guy, thing where like they just cut crop out a little area like this for the yeah. 78 leaders card uh from a 76 photo but with, with the logo man is I do believe that the new logo is different, right? The logo man is different than the old logo man. Now it's like a shiny, like metallic kind of looking logo man, right? Is that is I don't know if that's what uh it's exciting the new guys nowadays. I'll tell you, I don't know the first thing about it because it just doesn't interest me in the least. Like I yeah, don't I, get I, it at all. Like, yeah, like I said, the first time I saw it, <laughs> it was like I was at a LeBron James car. Where's where's his image? I was like, I I, I didn't like it. I was like, that's kind of ugly. That's not, that's not even a, a real sports car. Well, you can't even see the yeah. It's it. That's what that's what I was saying. It's about that logo. So if you want the logo, why wouldn't you buy a jersey for a tiny I, fraction I rather, of what the card would sell for? I would much a hundred percent would rather have the jersey than just the logo, man. Yeah, I mean, it almost it almost is classified more as memorabilia than a card to me. It's just yeah. not your typical sports card, you know. You know they're just getting, <laughs> yeah, they're get, they're getting Jersey so crazy. I don't know. Really. It's like it's like a a part of what should have been a great memorabilia piece. Yeah, pretty soon they're gonna have like holograms coming out the card, showing <laughs> like LeBron Wars. Duncan. That's the next generation technology. Yeah, all right, well, guys, I want baseball cards. <laughs> Yeah, I uh, I just uh, it was just on my mind because I watched the uh, King of Cardboard. Did you watch that? Uh, I know Dom, you said you didn't watch that yet. Did you watch that, Pepino? Yeah, I watched. I, I I had no interest in it, but then Lou Rock TV changed my mind on it, and because he said it's kind of like uh, American Pickers and stuff like that and Pawn Stars. But when I watched it, it to me it really wasn't because when you watch American Pickers. These guys know what they're looking at and, you know, and um, they actually appreciate what they're buying. Uh, the golden thing is more like all they're seeing is the dollar value. And that's just not what I'm into. All they talk yeah, about I, was price. And not only that, I, but like, seems like they weren't delivering. Like, oh, this, 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 I, yeah, I think I could get 10 million for this jersey. And then they didn't. You know what I mean? It just goes to show you how they don't know. Well, in fairness, they said they 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 didn't think they were going to get ten. Yeah, million, so but it shows you how dirty on. they are for taking it on when they knew they were going to fail. Well, uh, you know the thing is, is uh, like American Pickers. I agree a hundred percent. It's nothing like American Pickers because American Pickers are out there yeah. searching for things, and their stuff comes to them. And then I didn't think it was. I thought it had a Pawn Starsy feel to it, but it wasn't like Pawn Stars either because Pawn Stars. You get to see different things, learn about the history, and they they want to yeah, um, they come in, and 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 he's he, they show the buying, right? But yeah. they never show the selling. So with um, the king of collectibles, it was focused on the selling. So yeah. you could you could see what they were actually going for. You could yeah, see was, you know what they, either what they paid or what they wanted, yeah. and they're that's not paying them right. They're an auction house, so that the so so they're not buying and selling for a profit. Which yeah. which makes it very different than Pawn Stars. I thought it yeah. was well done. I thought it was engaging. Like I did find myself, you know, I the, it started off really boring, and I was about to turn it off because um, I just thought it was slow starting. And I'm a card guy, and it's very memorabilia focused. In fact, the only as far as the episodes I watched, the only two cards I saw sell 
were the LeBron logo man and the Steph Curry um, rookie. So they didn't have any old vintage cards on it. Um, but the one thing I will say, and if if you're watching, that Alex on there, and Dom, you'll appreciate this, that is a handsome, that is one handsome Italian woman. And uh, Alex, if you like older, bald men who are married, give me a shout. <laughs> All right. There you go. No, but I, hey, what do you think about this? Did, um, John I, I, think, I, I think, I think that is self funded by Golden because I've never seen a television show that where they have like testimonials, everybody's saying how wonderful they are. I mean, the show is very focused well, on the Golden Company. Are, are you familiar with, and, um, and, and Pawn Stars isn't like that, even though no, no. It, they're obviously the promoting. It's not the but, same. Well, me and my wife, me and my wife, we watch all that stuff, American Pickers, Pawn Stars, um, Swap Shop. We watch all, all uh, Car Restoration. We watch all those kinds of videos. That's why I wanted to give it a shot when New Rock said it. it's, it's kind of like those shows. Uh, I put it on, and my wife just, like, left. She had, like, no interest in it because it wasn't the same type of. Well, here, here's, the, th here's the thing to, to kind of demonstrate my point. With American Pickers, I'll bet you you don't know the name of their company. With yeah. Pawn Stars, I'll bet you don't know the name of their company. No. But with would... Golden, that's all you hear is Golden, Golden, yeah. Golden's well, a goat, what, Golden, what gold, I was gonna say, Golden's a goat. Are you familiar with the channel Junk Wax Hero? Yeah. Uh, no. He, he did like. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he did like a review on, um, on that show. And Ken Golden contacted him yeah and, I, I watched that i watched yeah, that you know what i mean and then he said oh i'll do an interview with you and then like he watched junk wax heroes show uh interviews and he said you know what i'm not interested ah that's kind of cheap yeah <laughs> boo i don't ken know i i kind of i kind of feel like that's you so kept funny. The work ken golden and i've um, done the interview with them yeah. i used when to produce i used to produce infomercials and they were pretty much the same as what he did only on a much grander scale uh but I have to say the show is very well done. It's engaging. Oh, it, and it's uh, well what done. they do, they draw you in because they show the auction. And then uh, before it, before, just as they, just, yeah, it's a cliffhanger. And then you have to watch the next episode. But uh, well done show, you know, kudos. And uh, I don't know when you, yeah, you know, anybody no watching that, you, you would think that, you know, Golden's an, an awesome company. What he's doing. You know, yeah. he's not being totally honest with people. Well, I, I don't know. You know, they're showing the things that sold for a lot. They're showing the things that sold for what, you know, above what they thought they would or the ones that they're making good deals on. But it's just like people well, who buy stocks or gamble. You never hear they're about the losses or the, or, or the things that aren't that great. Yeah, boo him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when you, when you have that kind of money, you can kind of push your own narrative, you whether it's through a show or interviews, so. Yeah, me based off what I saw. The yeah. only thing that matters is how much money you have. That everybody's character should be judged on that. That's why you know Putin and Hitler should be very respected because they're so damn. They had so much damn money, right? It's like I, your character shouldn't matter. It's just about how much money you are. I have yeah. an eighth of an acre in the ghetto. <laughs> yeah, that always fascinates me. We always judge people like. You know, if you're if you're 16 and you scream uh, the you know the uh, M F or into a microphone and you become a million you know multimillionaire overnight, then you you you're highly respected no matter what else you do in life. Like, don't, and it's don't like if you wrong. get drafted in the first round of the NFL draft, you're an instant you know yeah. one percenter. You're an instant one percenter, yeah. and uh, so you should like, be idolized. Like, don't get me wrong, I have nothing against. Golden, or even if you suck, them, even if you I, suck, I don't wish any bad against them, or I'm not going to talk bad about them. But what he does, eh, that's just not my thing, you know. Yeah, I mean, no, I, like I said, I give props. It was, it was well done. He seems to have a, a wonderful organization. Yeah, I have more power to him. I, I have, yeah, more power to him. I don't, I don't know anything about him or his company. I, I've, I've never used Golden. You, you don't get on the internet. Uh, no. Dom, have you ever used uh, uh, Golden? I haven't bought anything off there, but I've looked on there a few times. You have? Yeah, well, I don't, I'm I don't sure even know. I'm sure he has a bunch of great stuff, man. I'm sure he does, you know. Oh, heck yeah. Heck yeah. You know, I've always, and Pepino, and I think, I know you're this way too, is I'm, I'm more of a card guy, right? Yeah. Like, if it's, the memorabilia, like, you know, that Jackie Robinson jersey he showed was phenomenal. 
that's one of the rare times I would get excited for a piece of memorabilia. But just to have like a game worn jersey or somebody's, you know, st- stinky ass shoe. Why would I want that? Why would I want somebody's stinky ass shoe? I, I don't get it. I, I never did. Like, I don't want anybody's jock strap either. Yeah, like, well, that's like, one thing. Is like, to I me, that is talking, over idolization. Talking about, talking about the logo, man, like relics, uh, it, that because that's what it is. It's a relic. It's a jersey relic. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah. Same thing, you know, same thing with that is, like, when you have the laundry tag, it's like, why do I want the laundry tag? Like, that doesn't make sense to me either. Like, I'd rather yeah. have a nice patch of from the letters of his unit from the team or something, his number. The, the laundry tag, what the hell is that? I don't want that. Yeah, you know, uh, like the stuff that's from a special game, uh, you know, those things are exciting. But how many baseball, baseball games does a guy play over the course of his career, if, assuming he had a you know 20-year well, career or whatever, yeah. and just to have some random bat used by him uh, isn't really that exciting unless maybe it's Ty Cobb or Hannes Wagner or Babe Ruth. Yeah, that, uh, that, see, know. but that's that's the But nowadays, now. those bats that's, are a dime a dozen. They save the them all. They sell them rarity. all. That's the real difference in rarity. Like, say, the Jackie Robinson, they, they they believe he wore that jersey the whole year. Maybe there was a second jersey. Right. Nowadays, they get a new jersey every damn game. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And that's that's my point. Same with bats in the old days. I don't think they went. They use. They probably use a lot more. Well, when, you know, when, how many when, bats do when, they have made for them now? Yeah, when you see the old games, in front of the dugout, there'd be a bunch of bats laying on the ground, and the guy would just come up and pick a couple up <laughs> to see which one he feels best with. And how then how about they out. used to leave their 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 gloves in the field when yeah. they would come in? They would just lay the glove down and run in it. Yeah, that that, that was totally crazy. Nowadays. Now listen, when they used to do that, I've always been curious: is 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 the other team player using that glove, or does it just sit there? And if it just sits there, did balls bounce off of it, and they got base hits because of it? They had it probably used. That's probably why they would leave it on there for the other guy to use it. Yeah, I don't know. I'm I'm thinking because it's not like they had all the millions they have today. I know the the Chicago. So what a lot of people don't realize is. The Chicago Black Sox didn't get their name because they they threw the series. They actually got it the year before yeah. because their because their uniforms were so dirty, because Comiskey re- refused to get them new uniforms. So that means they wore those uniforms all year. So yeah, if yeah. you're gonna get a, yeah. one of those uniforms, it would be special, right? That's because they didn't have cool, fifty different ones throughout the year. That's a cool fact about uh like. With it, on that Ken Golden, when um, they showed the Jackie of Robinson jersey and the guy looked at it and he touched it, he's like, oh, my God, yeah. this had to be hot as hell. How could you play in this? Like, how yeah. uncomfortable that uniform was. Uh, you're a Chris Sale fan, right? Chris Sale, wasn't he the one that was going to start a game on Old Timers Day or, or Throwback Day? He and refused to wear the White Sox throwback, he refused, yeah. He refused to pitch. He's I'm not going to play. I'm not going to play in this. This is too, this is too uncomfortable. Well, it's because they have the money and the resources, yeah. So they yeah. don't need to be doing that. Yeah. Yeah, he refused to play in a wool uniform. He's like, I'm going to die out there. <laughs> well, I think they used to play in sweaters, right? Uh, you see a lot of baseball cards like uh, Betty Collins yeah, and uh, players underneath. like that with, with sweaters on. It, probably because the wool was so itchy. <laughs> well, I mean, if you were playing in the cold weather, you know, they didn't have the equipment like they, they do today. In fact, I, I I saw, and I think Ty Cobb was, Ty Cobb or Casey Stengel had to be one of the first players to ever wear sunglasses, the drop down sunglasses, because there are photos of them back in the day. And Casey Stengel is the one that really stands out to me. But I believe Ty Cobb might have used it too. Uh, yeah. Vincent back then. You know, they had those back then. Believe it or not, there's a wow. famous picture of Casey Stengel standing in the outfield with, and you can see the the shades. I used to love those drop downs, like you know, when a, you would see an outfielder look up and then drop them. Now they just have them down all the time. When I was in like Pony League or something, I I got myself some, and and you know they just were more distracting than anything. So I ended up uh, using them just a few times. They just distracted me. But you yeah, can't, you... Uh, you know, and if you use them, then you can't use the the excuse I lost it in the sun. Yeah, what do right. you mean you lost it in the sun? You were wearing sunglasses. I, I had to look through through the glove web, you know, for me to catch <laughs> water. 
son. <laughs> yeah. All right, guys. Well, I just uh, I had watched that show, saw that logo, man, and it had uh, rejuvenated that question for me because I thought that a long time ago, you know, and it, it's it just came to my mind again. I just wanted to discuss it because I don't get it. Dom, do yeah, we have any uh, any questions we should answer? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of great comments in the chat. Um, <laughs> but most of them are just kind of talking about the topics we're talking about, not asking questions that I see. Okay. All right. I well, I appreciate you Pete, taking a peek. All right, guys. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you go and wrap this up. But I appreciate you jumping on at the last second and uh, humoring me, indulging, uh -huh. indulging me. Yeah, thanks for having me on, John. It was great to finally talk to you, Caesar. All right, you too, yes. Dom. Great. Pepino, give us a classic ending. Love the hobby, people. Just keep collecting baseball cards forever, I said. Ciao! Thanks, everyone, for watching. All right. Bye, people.